Oh, it's a bad now, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, they, they shook, trembled, and I, I couldn't walk downstairs. I had to come down on the bottom until I could get to the bottle and drink. <coughs> and after about a quarter or a third of a bottle of whatever it was, I then began to feel all right again. If that's what people think is all right, then I was all right. Um, the main problem was getting through the day and trying to appear sober when I was stoned. This was a, a constant fight. I had to try and appear sober. I, I don't like drunks. I never did like drunks. Even when I was drunk, I couldn't stand them. Um, and so to, to keep over end and to speak in a sober manner without slurring your words and your top palate falling out, it was a terrific battle. And uh, I finally cracked. I couldn't keep this up any longer. And I cried. I cried an awful lot. I shed a lot of tears. Um, in fact, I thought I was going insane. And to, to wind up in a mental institution, um, I then began to wonder whether I was ever going to get well again. And it was AA, and the people in AA, one by <coughs> one, and together, that gave me the strength to keep sober long enough to be able to understand. It's very difficult to give this strength at first to a new member who was, as, who was as wobbly and as foggy as I was. And I can understand now why Bill W said and talked <coughs> about his aggressive attitude. You must do this or you must do that or else. And I, looking at my particular character defects, when I'm doing my little moral inventory, tend to have this. In fact, uh, I'm working on my defects all the time because when I was drinking for so long, it left me with a sort of ingrained attitude. And um, I now know that if I don't keep working at it, it's so simple to fall back into the habits and the thinking habits, if you like, of, of what I was or what I was like when I was drinking. I know it's getting better and I'm enjoying life more today than ever I've enjoyed it. Um, from being 19, 20 years of age. And the, the secret, really, was to give in, to stop fighting. I fought it. I got to be where I wanted to be. 19 years of age I went to sea and I said I was going to be a trawler skipper. <coughs> And I finished up being a trawler skipper. And um, I did tend to run my life like that. I fought and I hit out and uh, I got what I wanted. I also became an alcoholic by fighting. And so one of the big lessons for me was to, to give in and accept and not to fight. <coughs> and that's when I began to get the message also when I began to accept the A program, the A way of life and the A people. These were the people that mattered. The people that came to me at ungodly hours and spoke to me, talked to me, <coughs> quieted me down. The people that would jump into the car and drive me 70, 80 miles to a hospital when I couldn't drive myself people that could find the time and time's always been my biggest enemy it isn't now so much I'm working on it but um, I never seem to have enough time to do the things I want to do I never seem to have enough time to to, uh, to work with the AMA people as much as I want to do but I'm working on it as I'm told that I should 
And so it's very important to me is the common welfare of A because with it and from it I get my sobriety. I get it from other people. I can't get it for myself, by myself, with myself. I tried it that way and it didn't work. Going back to the last drinking spell, and we talk about the the um, insidious way that the alcohol or the alcoholic way of thinking, if you like, going back to a year last October, I went to my first convention at Selsey, and we had a week's holiday for me and I. Um, the weekend we spent at Selsey. <coughs> And it was a very emotional convention for me. I saw 700 people there, maybe about 550 alcoholics, dancing, laughing, <coughs> singing. And I didn't feel part of it somehow. Um, I just didn't, I couldn't yet dance and sing sober. I hadn't got it. Not the message, not properly. I wasn't happy with my sobriety. And a week after coming home from the convention, I drank again. And in my twisted alcoholic way of thinking, I said, I know why I've drank. I've heard that much about alcohol. I've talked about it for a week. I've been among that many of them, and I've finished up drinking the stuff. <coughs> and I know that wasn't the case either. But there was, during one of the meetings over the weekend, there was one fleeting moment when I could feel and sense the strength. Something that was there, I couldn't see it, I couldn't touch it, I could only feel it. The strength that was emanating around the room, this intangible thing that these people had. I, I have it today. And God willing, I shall keep it till the day I die. Thank you very much. Thank you much, very much, uh, Bill. It's usual when anybody is asked to do anything in A, they never refuse. And Bill is typical of that. He only had five minutes in which to take over from Peter. Uh, our next speaker is a guest speaker, or at least we call them guest speakers, and it's Leo from Liverpool. Uh, Leo is the convener for this year's Northern Convention, which is held in uh, November, I believe it is. And the poor man I mean, he'd only just arrived when I saw literally sprang on him and asked him uh, if he would uh, speak to us this morning. So we call them guest speakers, that's only the polite way of putting it. But uh, I'll now ask you, Leo, if you want to take a chance. Thank you. Uh, I mean, a polite way of being Lambert sort of thing. Mm -hmm. it. Well, uh, all right, I get it in short notice, but I've got to be, this, you get this honesty in AA, as well, you know, it gets you down a bit because you've got to talk out. If I'd have been asked two months ago to speak at this thing, I still wouldn't know what the hell I was going to say till I got up here. I'd like to uh, just uh, come in a little bit with Bill. There are certain professions that uh, are more liable to, uh, more prone to alcoholism than, uh, uh, than others. Seafaring is one, but I didn't become a trawler skipper. A trawler, oh Jesus, nearly did it then. A trawler, trawler skipper. I was in the catering department. I reached the top rank in that, and uh, also having more to do with entertaining than maybe the old man has, as you're the first line of defence for the shore authorities. It was a great thing. It was a, it was a, a heaven for an alcoholic, because you always had plenty of excuses, plenty of excuses. No, well, we know there's no reason, but, uh, good love us, uh, customs, those bums, you know, they come and 
get all this free liquor off you and things like that. I said, good heavens, where are they? They, they should have left the office by now. Oh, yeah. and of course, when I walked aboard, I could sit down with a drink in my dude. <coughs> they, 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 were, they were great uh, They were great guys at customs. I never had any, you hear about people hiding booze. I never had any trouble about hiding booze. I was in charge of the lot. I just had to walk up one flight of stairs in my own private key and I was in. And if there wasn't enough there, I had a bomb full down below. So I didn't have, a, I didn't have much to... Uh, much to worry about. Oh, I forgot to tell you my story. Now, now you can all sit back while I tell you my life story. I became an alcoholic because I drank too much. I did it too often. I did it for too long and I did it because I liked it. That's how I became an alcoholic. <laughs> I, uh, as a matter of fact, I gotta get that over long, uh, long uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. Also, uh, Bill said something about, about working hard. Well, don't worry us alkies, those that can work. The, we're, we're, we're not dumbbells as far as work goes. We usually reach pretty well in our profession. But the thing is, while we work so hard, we work hard, we put X number of effort into doing our job, then we've got to put the same amount of effort in again to cover up. Right now, I, I've retired, semi-retired. I, I do relieving now for the company, and they think I'm great. Now, I'm not kidding about this. This is a drunken bum they threw out 14 years ago. They think I'm great because they're getting the benefit of both efforts. They're getting twi twice the effort they'd get of anybody else. Uh, the uh, thing about, uh, what the hell was I talking about? Oh, yes, benefits about re re repaying. Somebody mentioned that one of our speakers were talking about re re repaying AA. Well, I used to figure this, you couldn't repay. Oh, I was sure when somebody came along to me said first said, you know, I'm getting more out of this than you are, I said, what a lot of baloney. How can he? can he? But I found out that you do. Trying to pass a message to somebody, we do get more than maybe the, the people, the person we're trying to pass a message to. Therefore, by that precept, you can never repay because your benefits are increasing so much that uh, you, know, you, you, never, you never sort of catch up. But there is one way we can repay. And this is by attending a group regular, not being Leo, not being any particular person, but being a member of a group that's available to help the still sick alcoholic the same way as a group handy when I wanted the help. My thing, the shipping company sacked me. Oh, I had the worst story in AA, sure. I had the worst story in AA, and it, but because it happened to me, I had a light one compared with quite a lot of people. The shipping company sacked me. Every superintendent in that outfit, they tried to cover up, for, well, they did cover up for me sometime or another, and the best thing they ever did was sack me. That's when I really, really woke up to myself uh, talking about this this friendship uh, uh, that you get in AA, you go all over the world, all over the world, it's just because I'm a seafarer, that's all. But no matter where you go, you, you just go and you say, my name's Leo, I'm an alcoholic. Your name doesn't matter, where you're from doesn't matter, but you get instant friendship. And you're not necessarily talking about the, the, the complaint, you might be talking about your dog, your granddaughter, what have you. The, this friendship, it's something, as people have said before, the love in a meeting, and also this friendship, the, the, the real deep friendships that we get in Alcoholics Anonymous. A friend of mine died last June, some of you might know him, I know some of the Manchester people know him. He died last June, and I never thought that I'd have such friendship and feel it so much for anybody that wasn't a member of my own flesh and blood. These friendships that you really get, and they they uh, they stick uh, they stick with you. Uh, also, uh, I think it was uh, Ben Fillon there who was talking about Jack London in the South Seas. There was also another great guy that wrote about a lot about the South Seas called Somerset Maugham, and I think it was in Rain that Sadie Thompson thing. You know, she wasn't a bad sort either. Uh, the the uh, Sadie Thompson one, Harry said. Tolerance is such a great virtue that it is practiced by so few, which is to do with uh, do with tolerance. Uh, uh, you get this things you, you you go through now, talking about as I say, I never had to hide. I never had to hide uh, hide uh, drug. But I, I'd go up in the morning, about four o'clock in the morning, wake up in the dry hours, and um, go up and try a bottle of Guinness. Well, I knew it was. A 
That signified spring right away, the return of the swallow. But, uh, and then, by about, say, half past five, I should have uh, gone through about half a bottle of rum by that time. Not this way, just rum and coke or a bit of rum and pep. That settled the stomach. But of course, that, 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 that settled the stomach enough to have a couple of Guinness. And the crafty Clara alcoholic, down to my room and just here's the boys around say, all oh, have me tea a little early this morning, thanks. You know, everybody wondered why I was so happy in the morning. So happy, I was rotten. <laughs> Matter of fact, I went up in inspection one day and the mate said to me, for Christ's sake, he says, don't breathe in the old man, he'll be rotten too. <laughs> uh, all right, I, I laugh and I joke. It's not serious, but I did not knock off screws to become miserable. I had a lot of laughs in my time, but I get a lot more now. They're real laughs now. And when you go around and you see these places, especially if you go into an AA meeting and you start off, well, the last time I was here, you know, until a blinder. <laughs> Went up in New York, Brooklyn. Went up to Rancher. Christ, you saw I drink in that place? As a matter of fact, I was on my way to a, a, an at-home in GSO. Did I drink in that place? And, I, and enjoyed it. These little crummy joints, but they sold hooch. That was the main thing. Of course, I was a bloke. I only drunk in the saloon bars. Oh yes, I conveniently forgot about every blue and low dive from here to Timbuktu that I went in for the simple reason: reason you could obtain booze, whether you bought it, whether you bunged it, you could obtain booze. The whole, the be all, to end all. Booze, booze, booze. Ah, uh, how are we doing here? Uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, the, the thing that I really think is this, the, the, the importance, the importance, well I'll get back to, I'm sorry if I'm roaming around a bit, what has AA got to offer? AA's got to offer hope, which we never had in the example of our own sobriety. Now that to me, that is a great thing, this example of our own sobriety. It is all very well saying you did 12 steps, 2 o'clock in the morning, 12 steps, and you tie yourself up so much that you break out again. But the example of our own sobriety, because if we're not sober, we're not going to help anybody, least of all me. I know that, I know that well and truly. The, uh, also, uh, AA, well, you know, what has it got to offer? Uh, that, that's what it, what it has to offer. But AA also will only help us with our alcoholic problem. That's something we must never forget. It'll only help, and of course we all know that help is the operative word because we've got to do the job ourselves. But I'll tell you what I will do. It'll give us guts, strength to tackle our other problems and not even maybe solve them, but tackle them, not run away like a, like a dirty big dingo. No, sir. I, uh, I, I thought I was sure the night before. What, what even old men, skippers, don't love me there. Only rate about six a penny till the next morning till he's got you up in the mat. So he got a different matter then. I finished my drinking career by being sent home from Amsterdam twice. Uh, but over, over a, well, uh, a period of two years. Of course, the second time there was no reprieve. And sure, I. Lord, the night before, I couldn't have cared less. And I was always a bloke that says, oh, what I got coming, I can take it on the chin, you know. Like hell I could. Please don't send me home. I'll get the sack when I get back to Liverpool. You know, I wasn't on my benders, but physically, I think I might have done a genuflect, I'm not certain about that. However, the uh, thing was that I didn't have the guts of a louse. The second time when everything was hopeless, I contemplated jumping overboard between the hook and Harwich. There's only one reason I didn't do that. I just didn't have the guts. I was frightened to see my wife. Not what she'd say to me. I was frightened to I was frightened to see her for the look in her eyes, that look of is there any show for us at all? Is there any chance? It was there. She was only five foot nothing, God bless her. But she had more guts than I had. More guts than I had in my half, five foot, uh, five foot six and a half. Anyhow, well, uh, I think I'd better get up. Uh, vomiting and rum, yes. Oh, yes, something, <laughs> as Bill said about defects, there's one thing that I 
very much believe in in, in AA. This defects. Let's not go defect, defect, and more blimmin' defects all the time. There must be some. What's it? Bobby Burns said it. The good and the best of us, and good and the worst of us, and bad and the best of us. There must be some virtues around, because otherwise, how the hell would we have something to grip onto to, to come good again? Something to grasp. Of course, well, we have to grasp. The thing I had trouble with was this higher power. Oh, good God, I couldn't get this know how. Everybody said, oh, yes, you'll get it. You've got to get it. And when I look back, hindsight, you, you, you can always <coughs> see how uh, higher power, I think. When I joined AA, my higher power could take a half a day off to go fishing or something because he couldn't before. He was working 24 hours. He was working twilights, night jobs and everything, just keeping me alive. I'll tell you something happened in Australia around about 27 years ago, I think it was. Well, of course... Uh, like all true uh, alkies, I belonged to the buffalo, so you could get a drink when the pubs were closed, you could go to a lodge. And this particular, this particular time, they were short of beer in Adelaide, and they decided they wouldn't have around about the new year. They wouldn't have a lodge this week, but they'd save the beer and have it the next week. Next week. I went to that one. I remember going. The next thing I know... I'm laying in the road and there's a bloke just screaming his head off. This is, this is the bloke that I'm talking about that couldn't believe in a higher power. Found it, found it hard. And, uh, okay, this bloke said, he was laying in the road, he was laying in the road. So I said, oh, this bloke is getting to my nerves. Anyhow, I said, what the hell are you talking about? Who was laying in the road, anyhow? He said, you were. So I said, okay, all right, don't you, don't, oh, God, there's ladies present. Don't you ever get drunk yourself? Oh, God, says, but he said, but he says, I'm not out of here. <laughs> well, I'm all right, so okay, I'm all right. What the hell are you worrying about? Here's a poor bloke running around thinking whether he's gone up to murder or manslaughter. I couldn't have cared less. And I, this is a bloke that had troubles believing in this higher power looking after us. My higher power looked after me a damn sight more when I was drunk. Than when, I was, than when I joined AA. The Lord looks after drunks and fools, and I was pretty well protected. <laughs> the, uh, the AA, because the, the great thing with me is one word as far as I'm concerned in AA, and that's want. We talk about trying to pass the message. My, that, that was the greatest thing that was going for me. My want, I don't know whether it was genuine, sincere or what, my want was desperate when I came along to AA. And because I had that desperate want, I was able to do as I was told. I could go out that door and never have another dream. I used to say I was lucky now. Fortunate. Fortunate. I had somebody looking after me then. Uh, AA won't do a lot of things. Uh, AA, it won't open the gates of heaven. But I'll tell you what it will do. It'll open the gates of hell so we can walk out. Thank you. Before lunch. <laughs> <laughs> One o'clock lunch. Thanks very much, Leo. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you heard six excellent speakers, and I'm afraid now it's your chance to put questions either to them, ask anything uh, or, or what Leo may have said, <coughs> or just air your views on uh, the subject but would you please please spare us that awful moment of silence which usually falls at this part of the proceedings <coughs> doesn't look as if I'm going to be lucky Uh, no, I thought that was cheating. <laughs> There's one question I'd like to ask uh, Bill from Hull. Bill is your name, isn't it? Yes. Uh, I did meet a member of AA from Hull who was a fisherman. And he told me that uh, when he went fishing, uh, they were allowed one top or two tops in the morning in the afternoon or something like that. I don't know anything about fishing yeah. at all. But uh, he 
told me they were an armed one or two, and the normal drinker took him, but he refused because on the odd occasion that he, he did take him, it made him ill. But yet, when he came ashore, the first place he headed to was to a public house. Uh, did you have uh, any similar experience? No, I thought I was, um, I thought like many, many more of us that I was normal when I was drinking because everybody else was doing it. I didn't think about it much at all. I drank for effect. I like the, the kick it gave me. Uh, I'm only five foot four. I think it made me feel six foot. Um, I, I was in there with the rest. I was doing what I thought was um, the accepted thing. Uh, I was a hard lad and I drank hard and I played hard. Um, the fishing fraternity is, is a, a drinking fraternity. Um, they're sober for three weeks, or they're dry, rather, for three weeks. And then they're, they're uh, stoned for two days when they come home. This was the conventional trawler that was away for three weeks and uh, was home for two days. And so you had to, to cram, you thought you had to cram three days fun into two days and this is where the heavy drinking comes in also that uh, if you'd had a good trip of course you had a lot of money to pick up and uh, this this made it easier because uh, you could drink all day and you weren't broke the next day you still had money to drink again for the next day and invariably we we still find this uh, i'm not a fisherman now by the way um i'm a publican <laughs> I'm one of the enemy. <clears throat> I did. Um, the, what what happens now, of course, is they still do this. Um, the the doctor told me many years ago when I was overweight um, as a skipper that I was going to have to cut out this habitual drinking. Um, he said, "How much beer do you have when you're at sea?" Well, as a skipper, uh, well, who told the truth anyhow? I didn't. Um, I used to say, well, I, I like me tot and me can of beer at uh, 11 o'clock, 11s is with the chief and the mate, and then I would probably have a couple uh, 10 or 11 o'clock at night before I went to bed. What I didn't tell him was the amount I had in between times in the chart room by myself. Um, uh, it's only just within recent months in this last year that I've started telling the truth about anything much after turning to drink. Um, so... Not all skippers, not all fishermen are like this. It is just is a heavy drinking fraternity. So what happens now is they still have money left, and if they haven't, they borrow uh, money, and they take cases of beer and bottles of spirits away with them. And that keeps <coughs> them going for a bit as well, you know, as well as their tot and their can of beer. Um, I'm a publican, now then. Um... I left the sea because of one thing and another, um, crew problems, I got fed up of it. I was getting fed up of it, generally speaking, over the past two or three years before I left the sea. This was five years ago. Um, and then I was um, doing nothing for five months. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to turn my energies. And we looked at boarding houses, fish and chip shops, you name it, um, and I finished up in a pub. It my drinking problem tremendously. You know, I, I, I was surrounded with it. it um, even aboard the ship, it was locked away in one particular little spot in the bond locker. But to be in a pub, it's on all the shelves, it's in the stock rooms upstairs, downstairs, and then you go downstairs, below downstairs, and it's in the cellar. You know, so you, you have it everywhere. And this accelerated the, the drinking problem, and this is when it really got out of control. I think it probably been out of control, uh, not realising it, but after I took a pub, um, it got out of control, and I realised it, that it was getting out of control. And I was terribly frightened about it, and I couldn't stop. And I drank myself into hospital. Thank you. Well, it's extra job for a question. <coughs> yes, Michael. I'd just like to ask Nora for her observations on the differences between her experiences in AA in Canada uh, and the way she's found us over here. Uh, by way of possibly taking our group inventories. 
Is there anything particular, Nora, that, uh, that you've seen as being uh, whereby we could profit from their experience? Um, well, I feel that AA, like people, is the same the world over, really. I've experienced it in several countries. And um, you do uh, conduct your meetings differently. Uh, for instance, uh, every meeting is closed with the Lord's Prayer in Canada, and I do believe in the States. Uh, at a con conference, as we call it, more of a weekend conference, you say it at the end of every solitary meeting. By the end of the conference, you've said the Lord's Prayer so many times, you know, that you feel it righteous. Um, and the meetings are conducted slightly different, I would say. But let's face it, it's all, it, all for the end result, isn't it? The end result is the same, I feel. Uh, one thing I did neglect to say in my talk was that I find that um, a great contributor to our common welfare is the friendship, the understanding, and especially the laughter in AA, that everyone contributes to my common welfare. And I hope that my friendship and understanding and laughter contributes to yours. And basically, I think this is what it's all about, isn't it? Carrying the message, no matter how you carry it. Your meetings are slightly different. Different. This convention this morning uh, is conducted exactly the same. Except that I think we say the Lord's Prayer and the Serenity Prayer more often. The only difference I was thinking more, more in the ways whereby AA could cooperate with other agencies. Oh. Well, they're doing the same thing in Canada. They're trying to... Um, they, they don't say that AA is the only answer. They feel that um, some people need psychiatry. Others need... Um, doctors for their physical well-being as well as AA and and abuse as well as AA some others don't myself personally I just sweat it out without even an aspirin because I didn't know enough to take one really I just simply sweat it out until I dried out and um, but a lot of people do need this and they are working in conjunction with psychiatrists they have open meetings uh, where they encourage everyone to bring their doctor or their psychiatrist or anyone in the in the professional field outside of AA we have special meetings uh, about twice a year where all the members are encouraged to bring an outsider you know, trying to make it more common knowledge. Thank you, Nora and Mike. <coughs> oh, listen, I've got a question. Yeah. I'd just like to thank our Liverpool Joey for the last sentence he gave us. Yeah. I have yeah. never heard it put as well in my life that AA won't open the gates of heaven, but by hell it opens the gates of hell. And I think yeah. that will stay with me for an awful yeah. long time. Honesty, honesty. I got that off a Negro girl in Stratton Island. <laughs> <laughs> uh, incidentally, uh, incidentally, you're wondering how far away Canada was for Nora. Well, I think I could lash her. I'm 13,000 miles away. That's where I originated from. <laughs> I drank for 20 years, I mean, and now they're seeing me in quite a different light. 
the stigmas was removed from it, but it must come into the, into the open. I've, I've given many talks for schools. I mean, the children now, it's, it's a growing thing. The children are drinking so much younger. And it all made me think, I had 20 years of, of drinking, five years of chronic drinking, and it all made, you know, forewarned, it's forearmed, and I feel that it's going to go more into the open. By the people who count, obviously, professional people, you know, it could be dangerous, but I have nothing to lose. And I feel if I can help in any way by, I mean, damn it, they all saw me for at least five, well, 20 years, but five years as a chronic alcoholic. They can see me now as a different person. Uh, you know, surely it will help A, and it must be brought into the open. It is a disease. And I, you know, there's no use keep hiding behind. I want to remove the stigma if I can. In any way I can, I will. And uh, I think that's really very essential. From what I can gather, it is being removed uh, in the United States. Uh, you know, they, they talk about it more. But I think it is a very essential point. <coughs> if but possible, which I understand some people can, yes. I can, and uh, if by my example, they've seen me now, I'm opposite, and I'm quite better than I was five years ago. But uh, I think it's a very essential point. I'm very yes. pleased to be here, and I'm sorry I'm just three speakers, but I feel really enjoyed doing it. Oh, we're delighted to have you, Peggy. I think several would like to I'd just like to endorse, actually, what you've said. Um, I don't go around wearing a placard, no, I don't. but I do not hide it from anyone. I am not ashamed of being an alcoholic. I'm not proud, but I'm not ashamed. And I feel that the more um, people can look at me and know that I'm an alcoholic and see a different conception of the accepted idea of an alcoholic, mm -hmm. which I have, you know, um, as somebody said, the, the unshaven man with the meth bottle, you know, yeah. this is great to me and I'll discuss it with my hairdresser or with, with anyone, well, you know, but this is a personal idea. thing, but I'm, I'm with you all the way there. My doctor, mm -hmm. I told him when I was three months sober, and now, actually, he treats me with the greatest respect, actually, I think they get rather specialised treatment, and I think yes. I think yes, you Thank you. Know. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm Bob, and I'm an alcoholic. I would just like to throw a suggestion open to the meeting, really, here, Alice, that um, there are lots of members in AA that, because of circumstances, can't get out to do 12-step work because, perhaps, of age or for a variety of reasons. And a suggestion that I've found very helpful is, for instance, for an AA member, if they can spare a little time each week, for instance, to join the local branch of the Samaritans, not to use the Samaritans as a front for their AA activities as such, but believe me, when fellow Samaritans know that you are a member of AA, it's fantastic how many people are referred to the AA member and how many Samaritans will phone them up just to ask their advice about what they might be able to do. But it's another way <coughs> that we can work <coughs> the uh, program. And as I say, it's just a suggestion for those that perhaps are a bit limited about the time you need. Yes, thank you very much, Bob. Actually, I do think uh, A ties up very much with the Samaritans. Here we have their other number, and I believe you do in Bradford. But uh, I also know that there are quite a few AA members that I know personally who are members of the Samaritans. One in this room, actually, sitting at the back. <coughs> are there any more? Oh. My name's Archie, and I'm an alcoholic. You say about going out and spreading the message and, and to the outside world. I think somewhere along the line, of you hear it said that alcoholics, alcoholics should not be organised. And I think this is where a lot of people hide behind the fact <coughs> of it says, oh, they shouldn't be organised. So they just wait and sit and wait for AA to come to them. But I think it's about time the organisation... Life's changing, 
Life's changed a lot <coughs> in my young day from today. And life is changing, and I think, whether we want it or not, I think AA will have to start changing a wee bit and towards the organisation side of it and take ourselves out more. Because I'm not afraid of, being an al of saying I'm an alcoholic. If it meant going down into the middle of Leeds and standing in the middle of the traffic and shouting that I was an alcoholic if it kept me sober, I would do that. I'm not, and I think this is where it is. There's a lot of people that recover and then they hear this and they read this part where it says, organization, AA should not be organized. This just suits them. They can just sit down on their backside and say, well, I'm sober, but AA shouldn't be organized. And I think this is where a bit of the lack is, is and I say this many a time, there has to be even organization to run a group. And there must have been an organization to get this going today. And I think if there was a bit more people getting involved in the organizing of taking the message out, we would do better and get more people in. And people would begin to know that the alcoholic isn't the man with the two coats, as they say, and the string holding the coats and the bottle of Jake in his pocket. But there is many other people. And I think this is where a lot of it will have to do. And there's a lot of good people who are capable of organizing <coughs> my personal opinion on that one is that if you I, I've found up to now that if you tend to push it um, I, as, a, as an alcoholic as a drinking alcoholic if anyone tended to push me I pushed back um, I came to AA because I, I, I needed it and uh, I was in and out of it. I didn't really want it anyhow. I didn't think I did. So it, it isn't something we can push, is it? it, it the, the, the person has to want it. I, I he has to got, want it. You can't, you can't take it to him all the time. Not taking it to it's him. the initial I thing is you've got to come to it. The group that got you sober, this is what I mean. I don't mean to organize the alcoholic organized within ourselves to take the message out to other people. Well, there's quite, there's quite a yeah, lot of this. You've got families all over the country doing that. I was at a, I was at a council for alcoholism on Friday afternoon, and in that particular room there were 12 people involved um, trying to um, get magistrates into the meetings, to get, uh, there was a chief inspector at the meeting, um, there was a doctor at the meeting, there was a director of the social services there, um, there was a member of the Samaritans, there was one of the Liberty Group. All these people were getting together um, with AA um, Corporation as well um, to help the, the suffering alcoholic. So it is going on. Uh, in schools all over the country now, there, there are lectures, um, um, I've been to a couple myself, and uh, members in, in this room also, no doubt, will have, will have been to, to lecture to, um, or to speak, not to lecture, to speak to children about the dangers of alcohol. And was, did the children think there was an alcoholic problem in the home? Was the mother or father suffering with it? And if so, um, w where they could get help and advice. So it is going on, and AA is there, and we are involved. I'd like to add to that that this is true, that slowly it is being introduced outside. Now, I, in the short eight months that I have been here, uh, there are two members, uh, women members, in our group now that are there uh, because the psychiatrist asked a, another member of our group, and he asked me, if I would contact them, which I did, and they are in our group and they're doing fine, they're doing marvelous. And also, I've been out twice speaking to outside groups. So that, in, I mean, that's only in a short period of time. Think, so it is the, being well, done. I, I think the table has got the wrong end of the gist of mine. Yes. You sit and you say in a meeting and people turn around and say, yes. but AA should not be organized. What no, I'm actually, but it is. I, it I needs think, to be organized. Yes. Actually, 
May I just, may I just answer you? Well, the organization, the risk. It says, I think you're slightly uh, slanting it the wrong way. It, say, it says quite distinctly, AA as such should, be, should not be organized, but should create service board, service officers, and various channels through which to pass its message. <clears throat> and in this country, it's done exactly that way through the conference, through the service board, through the general service office, down through the intergroups and the intergroups. So the whole structure not only goes down, but it goes up. The organization is there for us to use. It's the individuals that Bill was talking about, not the structure and the way to pass the message. I think it was slightly out of context. <clears throat> It's not, um, not, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll finish it yes. there. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid we shall have to leave the questions now. Thank you all very much for putting them to it. It's a, a very interesting discussion. Perhaps we'll get together later. Uh, I think by the interest shown this morning, and uh, our, and by our, I mean AA's welfare, not only should but certainly does come first. It's rather remarkable when you think it all started uh, by our two co-founders getting together and discussing their common problem, having each other's welfare at heart, and then going out when they found they could find some peace by this means, and passing the message on to other still-suffering alcoholics I always think of uh, the two co-founders as at the top of the triangle we have on our sign with Bill and Bob just at the top <coughs> and widening out and widening out as they found other members to join them uh, in uh, keeping their welfare first and... Uh, <coughs> just by sticking to this simple program and placing their welfare first. This must always be so. The welfare and unity of AA is our most cherished quality. Our fellowship has, our lives and indeed the lives of those to come depend squarely upon it. Thank you all very much for being such a lovely audience this morning. And I know you want me to thank our six very able speakers, so if you'll show in the usual way. <laughs> I have uh, two commercials. Uh, one is the literature. Out in the foyer, you'll find uh, literature, a very, uh, a very great uh, choice, uh, both for Al-Anon and AA. Last year we sold quite a record. I've been told I have to tell the amount. Uh, amount we want to try and exceed it this year. But if there is anything at all you want, you know, you've thought, oh, well, that sounds interesting, just have a look, and I'm sure it will be there. The other one is uh, for, uh, it says, Welcome to the first Humberside Gathering, AA and Al-Anon, uh, to be held at the Ferry Boat Inn at Hessel on Sunday the 20th of April, 2 <coughs> until 6. <coughs> well, it's nice and cheap. Ticket 50p and you get a buffet tea mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, we've finished very nicely, just bang on one o'clock. The Yorkshire Puds should be out by now, or you might have five minutes just to stretch your legs and get your appetite. So, if you would all like to join me in the strength of the hour, we'll close the meeting. Well, God knows serenity, but I accept the things I cannot change. Perish to change the things I can. And the difference is the difference. Thank you. Where's the Peter? This is the afternoon session. Afternoon session. Open, mixed.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this open meeting of our annual One Day Convention. Please join in a few minutes' silence to consider how fortunate we are to be here this afternoon and perhaps spare a thought for our friends who can't be with us today. Thank you. My name is Michael and I'm an alcoholic. When Morris, on behalf of the Convention Committee, asked me to take the chair this afternoon, a couple of months ago, he happened to mention that the best chairman he'd heard in recent years was at the General World Service Conference in London last year. He went on to tell me that that chairman made no comments whatsoever on the speakers. I saw this as a get out and I immediately accepted the offered position of chairman this afternoon. However, things seldom go as we expect and uh, last Thursday evening I had to give Morris's wife Monica lived down to Leeds and we got to talking about today's convention uh, and she pricked my conscience. If therefore you are upset, aggravated or just bored to death with my opinions, you know who to blame. <laughs> the theme of this convention is our common welfare. As was said this morning, they are the first three words of Tradition 1. In full, the tradition reads, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends on AA unity. The 12 traditions are founded on experience. Few problems arise today in AA that have not been count encountered before. They are set down for us by the early members of AA as guides whereby our groups can function and develop without foundering on the rocks of disagreement, personality conflict and so on that so many other gatherings and societies have sunk on in the past. They're often acknowledged as being to the groups and the structural bodies in AA what the 12 steps of the programme are to the individual AA member. If we accept this as a reasonable parallel, then we see the importance of our theme today. <coughs> After all, who among us doubts the wisdom and importance of the first step of our programme? At the risk of stating the obvious, unless we put our common welfare first and thereby preserve the continuation of the fellowship, how can we ourselves recover and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety? <coughs> so, we must ask, having accepted the importance of the theme, how can we put this precept of common welfare into practice in our daily lives? Well, in many ways, if we think about it. Perhaps <coughs> best summed up in the slogan behind me, I am responsible. Responsibility necessitates involvement. And that reminds me of a story I heard at the Dumfries Convention last year about the member who'd had a slip and afterwards bemoaning the fact he said, but I've been around AA five, six, seven, ten years. The lesson in the story is in the word around. To grow in sobriety, most of us need to be in AA. In, in this case, being an abbreviation for involved. So how do we get involved? I can tell you from my own experience just now that this involvement is a very positive benefit to us, or to me, as an AA member. About three years ago, I changed my job and I was travelling around the country um, pretty well every week. I would go to places like Leicester, Nottingham, Birmingham, Newcastle on Tyne, Manchester, 
And I would go to AA meetings during the week at those places. I've met some of you from that time. But on a Friday, I found myself making excuses for not going to my own group in Bradford. I was in Manchester and by the time I got to Bradford it would be 8 o'clock, I wouldn't have any tea and so on and so forth. And whilst I didn't slip, I didn't have a drink. I wasn't very happy with life. Um, eventually, it dawned on me that this was why. Whilst I was attending AA meetings, <coughs> I was always only a visitor. And as such, I was never called upon to get involved in the groups that I was attending. After a bit, I started going back to Bradford, and I did get involved. I started washing up and so on. Um, and shortly after that, I did begin to get back some of the inner contentment and satisfaction that I'd had earlier in my AA life. When we first come to AA, for many of us, it's a question of either going to a meeting or going to the pub. But after a while, quite naturally, a lot of us develop other interests. If we allow these, though, to prevent us from going to meetings regularly, where are we to find the opportunities of involvement and subsequently our common welfare? If we do not avail ourselves of these opportunities of trying to practice the program, then we must be putting our own sobriety in jeopardy. Finally, to those friends from years ago who we only see infrequently or not at all these days, I would like to say, not only with respect but with love, that you are sorely missed. Not by today's new members, because they don't know you, but by those who are now comparatively old-timers, <coughs> but to whom you were once founder members. The Fellowship of AA will survive without those absent friends because the message they passed on was genuine and strong enough to ensure continuity. But we would be the richer for their experience at our meetings again. <coughs> our common welfare principle would be strengthened and the miracle of sobriety would be worked by our higher power on even greater numbers. And now, friends, I shall call on our first speaker for this afternoon, Bill C. from Leeds. serious offence. I've never been in a physically bad state and I've never been financially broke. And yet I know I have proof positive that if I take one drink, my life is unmanageable. I'm away with the bees. So when I was asked to speak to you this afternoon, I had lots of choices and I decided it was a very big task I had. So the first thing I thought, well, there's a story about an Irishman, an Englishman, and a Scotchman. And they were all going to the building site to get a job. Well, our Paddy was away from the bogs in Ireland, you see, and he was very frightened and very nervous when he heard he had to have an interview with a foreman. So the job goes in first, and he comes out and he says, Paddy, it's all right, he says. The old foreman says, do you know your right from your left? So the jock said, I told him I did. So he held up his right hand. And I said, you've a right hand up, sir. So he said, right, start tomorrow morning at the top. So Paddy's feeling a bit more confident. <coughs> the English fellow goes in and he comes out, Paddy, no problem, he says. He held up his left hand, and I told him it was his left hand. No problem, got the job. 
So Paddy's feeling very comfortable now. Excuse me. So the then the foreman's feeling a bit cold. And there's the old foreman over an oil stove, going like this. And Paddy says, Ah, oh, Jesus, sir, give us a chance. Don't shuffle him at first. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we have a choice, and we have a choice between right and left, between <coughs> sobriety, which I personally get, within AA. Without AA, my life is a man. So the choice I make, I've shuffled all sorts of combinations up, but I still come back to the one thing, and that is why we are all here today, for our common welfare. We help one another, we help us all to obtain sobriety and to be civilised and good members of the community. Now, there's one way to get married and confused. That's putting two shovels against the wall and saying, Paddy, I want to take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> I have taken my pick. And my pick <coughs> is to give as much into AA, our fellowship, our wonderful fellowship, as I take out, but I can only give once I've received something. So our common welfare is what we are all giving to one another here today, because in fact we're taking it from each other to give our way again. Now, what I would like to spend a couple of minutes on is the definition of R, which I personally had a lot of problems in working out before I spoke to or started speaking this afternoon. Now, are we correct in saying R in the very close circle of this fellowship, Alcoholics Anonymous? Or are we more correct in possibly being less selfish in defining R, the noun R, as ourselves, not in isolation within AA, but now that we have got our sobriety, or are obtaining our sobriety through AA, where do we stand so far as the community in ours goes? Is our common welfare, are we correct in thinking of our common welfare just amongst the close-knit circle of AA, or should we think more of where we as individuals through AA fit in to the community at large? So what is our common welfare? Is it the welfare of just ourselves here within AA? Or should we in fact be thinking how we can help the community at large? Because there are people who are non-alcoholics who have a very, very difficult life because they haven't got the benefit that we have of our suggested 12 steps of the AA philosophy of life. I am quite certain I am convinced without any shadow of doubt that there are more people unhappy outside of AA than there are inside of AA. <coughs> so I believe, seriously and honestly, that we have an awful lot to give from our fellowship towards the community at large. And by our example, that is the best way we can do it. So ladies and gentlemen, I always like being short and quick to the point. I would like to end by asking you, each and every one, to try and define how you relate to the norm R. Thank you very much. For having me.